Okay. So let's see the question. Your patient is a 32 year old woman who presents with heavy bleeding. So I'm going to try and teach you the approach. So I'm going to highlight the keywords for you and it's for you then to connect the keywords and give me the answers. Okay. So heavy bleeding, her blood pressure is 80 by 50, her pulse rate is given, abdomen is soft and non-distended. Okay. So abdomen is soft, non-distended. Examination reveals 200 ml of clotted blood in the vagina. The os is open with tissue protruding from it. The uterus is 10 weeks size. Which of the following is the most appropriate step? Right? So everybody commit your answer. Each one of you has to commit your answer so that we are able to assess is our approach right or wrong? Is our approach right or wrong? Okay, quick, quick, very good. I think almost everybody is trying to commit their answers. And yes, now let's see what everybody is saying. So I think unanimously, the answer is C. That's right. The answer to this question is C. Now let's figure out what are we dealing with? Yes. So now having the C, you know, the keywords together, what is your diagnosis in this question? Who's going to tell me what is the diagnosis? So, very, very right. The diagnosis is incomplete abortion. How do we reach to that diagnosis? What are the key words? So, the patient has history of heavy bleeding and very importantly, os is open. Okay? Not just the os is open, you can see tissue is protruding from it. Okay? So, tissue protruding from the os, history of heavy bleeding, the os is wide open. Yes, we are dealing with incomplete abortion. Who is going to tell me what are the other three choices done for? So, what is a very close differential diagnosis here? So, close DDs would be other types of abortion. So, can you tell me in which other abortion the os is open? In which other type of abortion the os is open? So that is going to be one close DD and yet another DD would be ectopic pregnancy, right? So early pregnancy, patient coming to you with bleeding, one of the other DDs is ectopic, right? So the other condition where the os is open is inevitable abortion. Yes, the other condition is inevitable abortion. But who is going to think and tell me why is this not inevitable? So, in inevitable ab abortion, the os will be open, but there is no history of tissue being expelled, right? So, this is what is required for inevitable, no history of expulsion of products, right? Also, please see here, look at, you know, um, what we are seeing. So, we are very clearly saying that you are seeing tissue coming from the os, Right? So, which means there is history of expulsion of products. So, it cannot be inevitable abortion. Yes? Now, ectopic. Which type of ectopic is the DD here? So, we want to keep ruptured ectopic as a DD. Why do we want to keep ruptured ectopic? Because the patient has come with unstable vitals. Yes? The patient has come to us with unstable vitals. So, a closed DD is going to be ruptured ectopics. Right? So, ruptured ectopic. Can you tell me? Okay? Can you tell me? No. So, we are talking here about inevitable uh, Vishal. I said an inevitable abortion. There is no history of tissue being expelled. Okay? So, I am creating a DD for you here. Alright? Yes. So, yes. Even in ruptured ectopic, the patient can have unstable vitals. But what are the things that go against ruptured ectopic here? So, look at the other keywords now. It says, the abdomen is non-tender, non-distended. Right? So, please remember, if it is a ruptured ectopic, what would be the finding? The finding would be pain. So, there is going to be abdominal tenderness. Right? Because once the ruptured ectopic is there, there is peritonitis. Right? So, in case of peritonitis, there will be abdominal tenderness. There may even be guarding and rigidity. Yes? So, there may even be guarding and rigidity. 
and no abdominal distension. So there is nothing collected inside, no blood collected inside, right? So these things tell us that this is not a case of ruptured ectopic. What do we do caldocentesis for? So caldocentesis is done exactly for ruptured ectopic, right? So in caldo, you're going to aspirate blood from the pouch of Douglas. And then if you do aspirate blood that does not clot, you know it is ruptured ectopic. So this is why caldocentesis is not an option. Similarly, laparotomy or laparoscopy are done for ruptured ectopic. How do we decide between, okay, how do we decide? No, yes, exactly. Again, Vishal is right. If it is ruptured ectopic or ectopic pregnancy, the os is generally not wide open, right? So the os is not open. And very importantly in this question, look at the size of the uterus. It's already 10 weeks size. If it is ectopic pregnancy, the uterus would not be given to you as a 10 week size uterus, right? So this means the pregnancy is intrauterine, okay? So this means pregnancy is intrauterine. So, so please remember, caldocentesis, laparotomy or laparoscopy are all done for ruptured ectopic. How do you decide between laparotomy and laparoscopy for ruptured ectopic? So remember that if the vitals are unstable and the patient is ruptured ectopic, then we would want to do a laparotomy. Whereas if the vitals are stable and she has ruptured ectopic, then we go for laparoscopy. Right? So, if the vitals are stable then and it is a ruptured ectopic, then we will go with scopy. If she is unstable and it is a ruptured ectopic, we will go with laparotomy. Right? So, everyone, are you clear how we approached early pregnancy and bleeding? Yes? So, remember, these are the key things to look for when you get a clinical question on early pregnancy and bleeding. Uh, ectopic pregnancy. And, uh, you know, uh, abortions are very close differential diagnosis, right? So, is question number one good for everybody? Could everybody get a, get a good hang on question number one? I want you all to give yourself a score. So, if you have done question number one, please take a plain sheet of paper and you're all going to post it somewhere, either on Telegram or on Instagram and tag me. So, you will write in your plain sheet of paper question number 1 and you will say I have done it right and you are going to give yourself marks out of 15 and in every question you will write something called as A which means was your approach in the MCQ right or wrong, okay. So, whether your approach in the MCQ is right or wrong then you put a tick. So, if your approach was right, it means you can apply concepts. That's the art that you have to learn. You have to learn your content, but at the same time, you have to learn to apply that content. Okay? Don't worry, Shivangi. I will talk about caldocentesis in yet another question. We do have a question. I'll clear all your doubts. Okay? Shallow. Let's move over for question number two. Everybody, question number two is going to be on your screens. Now, are you all ready for it? All right. So, let's look at, oops, okay, give me a moment. Right, so let's look at question number two. So, your patient is a gravida four. She is currently six weeks pregnant and she has come for her first prenatal visit. Her past obstetric history is significant for three second trimester losses. She says that every time she goes to a hospital, she has a widely dilated cervix. She does not recall having painful contractions prior to the diagnosis of dilatation in any pregnancies. Now the pelvic examination shows cervix is long and closed. What is the best appropriate management for this patient? So now, can you all commit your answer? Okay, commit your answer. What are you going to say? I'm going to give you two seconds. Everybody will commit their answers and then we will start discussing. Okay, Hanji, everybody start committing your answers. What do you think is the answer here? All right, good. So now let's look at what the answer is and how we will approach it. Yes, 
So the correct answer is B. Okay, the correct answer is B. Put a cervical stitch at 12 to 14 weeks even if the cervix is closed. So who is going to tell me what are we dealing with here? So definitely we are dealing with a case of recurrent pregnancy loss. And what is the cause of this recurrent pregnancy loss? What do you think? The cause is cervical incompetence. Right? So the cause is cervical incompetence. So why is the cause cervical incompetence? Let's look at the keywords. Your patient has second trimester losses. Very, very important. So please remember in cervical incompetence, you will see only and only second trimester losses. You will never see first trimester recurrent pregnancy loss. So what you see has to be a second trimester RPL. But very interestingly, what is the other requirement? These losses have to be painless. So they have to be recurrent losses. They have to be in the second trimester and they have to be painless, right? So, if my patient has more than or equal to three such losses, right? So, if my patient has more than or equal to three such losses, which types? Recurrent losses, all in the second trimester and all should be painless. So, if she meets more than or equal to three such losses criteria, then she meets what? She meets the history based criteria for cervical cerclage. Which means her history itself is significant to put a cerclage. So your patient meets the history based criteria for cervical cerclage. Right? And then now we have decided that in this pregnancy, she will definitely be put a cerclage. What is the ideal time to put it? The ideal time is 12 to 14 weeks, right? So the ideal time is 12 to 14 weeks. And please remember, an important contraindication for the cerclage will be ruptured membranes. Okay, we will never put a cerclage if the membranes is, are ruptured. Another important contraindication would be gross congenital anomaly in the baby, right? So, gross congenital anomaly in the fetus. And if my patient has a current pelvic infection, then yes, she is not a candidate because these are absolute contraindications. But in this case, there are no such contraindications. So, we will put a cerclage, we will plan it for 12 to 14 weeks. Yes, that's the ideal time to put it. And now, let us look at the other options. Why is the answer not serial ultrasound for cervical length? So, please remember, either my criteria can be history-based cerclage or it can be ultrasound-based cerclage, right? So, what is ultrasound-based criteria? So, ultrasound based criteria is, if my patient does not meet the history based criteria, but my patient is high risk, okay? So, if my patient is high risk, but does not meet the history based criteria and has a second trimester cervical length less than how much beta? Less than 25 mm. Okay, and she has a second trimester cervical length less than 25 mm. Then yes, again, in these patients, we would put a cerclage. But this now becomes ultrasound based criteria. Okay, no Shubhasri, twins is not a contraindication. So you have to understand this. Twins by itself is not a contraindication. But if you see a twin pregnancy with short cervical length, then yes, she would become a candidate. But twin herself without any other risk factor or short cervix is not a criteria to put a cerclage. So you will only put it if she has a risk factor and she has a cervical length which is less than 25 mm. Is that clear to everyone? Perfect. 
Also, please remember whenever we put a surcharge, always and always with the surcharge, we have to add progesterone to the patient. So, always with surcharge, we will also give progesterone to the patient. Yes. Okay. Can you tell me what is the third way of making the diagnosis? So, one is history based, one is ultrasound based. What is the other way? The other is examination based. Right. For example, a patient comes to you in the second trimester with painless cervical dilatation. Right. So, here the cervix is already fully dilated. So, now can I still put a surclutch? Yes. So, now the, you know, the cervix is already fully dilated and membranes are bulging. So, membranes would be bulging into the cervical canal, right, or into the vagina because the cervix is fully dilated. So, membranes are bulging but they are intact, not ruptured. Then I can also again put a surclutch and this is called as rescue surclutch, okay, also called as emergency surclutch. So, you should all, all know that when the cervix is already fully dilated, then the surclutch that we put is going to be emergency or rescue surclutch. Yes, everybody you got the concept? What is history based? What is ultrasound based? And what is examination based? Okay, right. So, as I said, she already meets the criteria. Therefore, option 3 and 4 are incorrect. So, now everybody who got question number 2 correct is going to put a tick mark and if you got the approach to the question also correct, then again put a tick mark. So, we have to assess ourselves on both the things. Were we able to answer the question only by ruling out options or did we know the correct approach? Okay, so based on that, put a tick if you have got both of these things correct. Are you ready for question number 3? Yes, everyone ready for question number 3? Shallow. Let's move on to question number 3 now. Okay, and it is on your screen now. Your patient is 16 weeks pregnant and she is undergoing a urine analysis. A dipstick by the nurse indicates presence of glycosuria. All other parameters of the urine test are normal. Which of the following is the most likely etiology? Can you tell me what is the answer? Can you please uh, comment or comment? Can you comment on your answers? Let's see how many of you can, uh, you know, commit a correct answer and then we'll put a tick mark. Okay, very good. I can see most of you are able to commit your answers. So, what is the answer for this question? Yes. The answer is C. The patient's urine analysis is consistent with normal pregnancy. So, you know, the body undergoes a lot of physiological changes. Yes. So, you have to know what is physiological and what is pathological. Only if it is pathological, she needs to be evaluated further. Right. But is glycosuria physiological? Yes. Is it physiological? Yes. Glycosuria may be physiological. Okay. Why is it or why is it a possible physiological finding? Because the renal threshold for glucose. Okay. The renal threshold for glucose in urine is going to decrease in pregnancy. Right. So, the renal threshold for glucose decreases. And as a result, glucose starts appearing in the urine even before, you know, the levels are very high. So, even at lower levels, it will start appearing in the urine. Now, in this question, does your patient has diabetes? No. But do you need to still evaluate her for diabetes? Tell me. Now, my next question to you is, maybe we make the question a little more tough and we ask you, do you need to evaluate her for diabetes even now or no? So, you, till you tell me the answer, I will talk about options B and D. So, the patient does not have a urine infection, does not have a kidney disease. Why? Why? 
so the reason is because the other things in the urine are normal right so the other urine analysis parameters are normal if it was infection then i would see wbcs i may even see bacteria right not just glucose yes and if it is kidney disease there would be some other hint for example casts in the urine right so i may see cast in the urine i may see some other findings which are different okay so this is not a patient with kidney infection or kidney disease or a urine infection so yes coming back to the question does the patient still need evaluation the answer is yes so please remember all patients or rather i should say all pregnant women they are not patients as of now so all pregnant women based on our national guidelines must undergo screening for diabetes okay so we do universal screening okay so we do universal screening right for all pregnant women in pregnancy when are you supposed to see or do the universal screening so please remember as per our national guidelines okay the screening has to be done twice we have to do it at the first antenatal visit and then if this is normal i will also do it beyond 24 weeks okay so usually we will do it between 24 to 28 weeks right why are we doing it in the first antenatal visit because india belongs to a category where we are high risk for diabetes so uh, we must do the screening even at first antenatal visit why are we doing it later because we know that pregnancy is a diabetogenic state right so in pregnancy there is insulin resistance who is going to tell me which hormone is the reason for insulin resistance in pregnancy yes the hormone is hpl so pregnancy is a state of insulin resistance and as pog increases we all know insulin resistance also increases so beyond 24 weeks the resistance becomes significant so we must test her again for gestational diabetes mellitus right what test do we do so now this is the thing that we need to discuss here please remember our national guidelines are dipsy guidelines okay so our national guidelines are dipsy which is a 2 hour ogtt test okay the glucose load is 75 grams the patient need not be fasting okay so the glucose load is 75 grams the patient does not have to be fasting you give her this and you take a blood sample after 2 hours any value beyond 140 is considered as gestational diabetes mellitus and value beyond 200 is overt diabetes okay if it comes out to be beyond 200 it is overt diabetes please remember before we had our national guidelines now we have but before we had our national guidelines we used to follow the iap dsg criteria not now but we used to earlier follow iap dsg which is also a 2 hour ogtt where the glucose load is again 75 grams but the patient has to be fasting right and we used to take three samples a fasting sample a one hour sample and a two hour sample what were the cutoffs 92 180 and 153 right so the levels were supposed to be 92 180 and 153 and even if one or more value is beyond the cutoff okay so even if one or more value is beyond cutoff we would say the patient has gestational diabetes mellitus right so iap dsg were the older guidelines but now we have our national guidelines which are the dipsy guidelines yes okay so everyone good with this one yes so remember what you have to do if you have got question number 3 correct put a tick 
and if you got the approach correct again put a tick okay everybody ready for question number 4 okay question number 4 is on your screens now so your patient is 7 weeks pregnant she has come for her first antenatal visit her previous pregnancy was a missed abortion in the first trimester now the patient is very anxious to know about the well-being of the current pregnancy which of the following modalities will you do to best document fetal heart rate what is the answer for this question commit your answer everyone come on question number four let's see what you have to commit as an answer so everybody are you putting down your answers okay so now what is the answer for this question? The answer for this question is D, transvaginal ultrasound, right? So, we would be doing a transvaginal ultrasound. When does a regular stethoscope or a fetoscope for that matter will make you hear the heart sounds? Probably anywhere between 18 to 20 weeks, not earlier than this. So, a fetoscope or a stethoscope, you cannot hear the heart rate at 7 weeks. Now, when they say a special fetal Doppler equipment, do you know what Doppler are we talking about? We are talking about a special equipment which is a handheld Doppler. So, this handheld Doppler can pick up heart rate at a relatively earlier time which is around 10 weeks. So, again, handheld Doppler cannot pick up the heart rate at 7 weeks. What about ultrasound Doppler? What about ultrasound Doppler? So, please remember, ultrasound Doppler is not routinely used in first trimester. Okay, so it is not routinely used in the first trimester as Doppler generates heat and hypothermia or increase in heat is not good for the embryo during organogenesis, right? So, extreme heat can be teratogenic. So, Doppler ultrasound is not routinely used in the first trimester because it's not absolutely safe in the first trimester. Can you do it later? Yes. So, obviously, we can do it later in pregnancy, but not routinely in the first trimester for heart rate, right? So, the best and the safest, okay? This would be best in the first trimester as well as safest in the first trimester, which will be a transvaginal ultrasound. How early can a transvaginal ultrasound uh, show us the fetal heart rate? So, transvaginal ultrasound has a special mode which is called as M mode. So, the ultrasound has M mode which stands for what? Motion mode. And this motion mode actually picks up the cardiac motion. So, it will show you the fetal heart rate, right? Now, as I said, how early can we see it? As early as 5 and a half to 6 weeks, okay? So, transvaginal ultrasound can show us fetal heart rate as early as 5 and a half to 6 weeks. And what would be the answer for abdominal scan? Abdominal will be one week later, right? So, approximately, you know, uh, 6 and a half to 7 weeks for abdominal scan, right? But most of the times, your exams don't have these half options. So, if you have to mark one single answer, Earliest time for transvaginal ultrasound, it will be 6 weeks. So, usually I am saying these half options are not there. The options are 5 weeks, 6 weeks, 7 weeks, 8 weeks. So, then the single best answer would become 6 weeks. Is that clear to everyone? So, this is a good time to pick up cardiac activity. Okay. So, very, very important. Also, remember first trimester ultrasound is the best time to look for gestational age assessment. What is the parameter we use here? The parameter we use here is crown rump length. 
and the ideal time okay the ideal time for crown rump length is anywhere between 7 to 10 weeks although we can use it even up to 14 weeks but the ideal time is 7 to 10 weeks is that good for everybody so now if you marked question number 4 correctly put a tick mark if you had the correct application or approach using your basic concepts put a tick mark okay is everyone enjoying do you feel you are really seeing clinical patients although you know you realize that the theory is same does everyone realize that content cannot change the basics don't change only thing you have to do is you have to connect the dots and you have to think of basics in an applied manner right is everybody else or everybody able to do that are you able to learn the approach to clinical vignettes yes okay ready for the next one everybody okay the question is on your screen now the question shivangi the slides would be updated beta it, this will everything will be uploaded even the pdf would be uploaded for you the annotated pdf okay so what is the treatment of choice for a 28 year old woman who is on follow up for post molar evacuation and shows the following chest x ray finding okay so everybody see the question and commit your answer i want everyone to commit their answer i want everyone to commit their answer all right ready everybody should i tell you the answer now okay so the answer to this question is d okay the answer to this question is d multi dose methotrexate now let's see why what patient are we dealing with now our patient of molar pregnancy has converted into gtn yes so patient of molar has converted into gtn can you tell me what is the gtn here which gtn the gtn is choriocarcinoma why is it choriocarcinoma because choriocarcinoma is the only GTN that shows distant metastasis. And the X-ray findings are suggestive of cannonball metastasis, right? So choriocarcinoma is the only GTN that shows distant metastasis. So this is GTN. Can you tell me what is the most likely molar pregnancy this patient had? What is the most likely molar? So she most likely had complete mole. Why? Why not partial? Because the risk of conversion of complete mole to choriocarcinoma is around 4%. But the risk of conversion of partial mole to choriocarcinoma is negligible. We say it is less than 1%. Right, so therefore, most likely my patient had complete mole and she has now developed choriocarcinoma, GTN, gestational trophoblastic neoplasia. Okay, so gestational trophoblastic neoplasia. Okay, now coming to once we have identified what has happened, do you know that the most common site for metastasis of choriocarcinoma is lungs? So, most common site is lungs. Who is going to tell me what is the second most common site? The second most common site is going to be vagina. Okay. The second most common site is going to be vagina. And I think Dr. Sumer is here to do the integration. Okay. What do you want? <laughs> Dr. Sumer wants to do an integration for you and he wants to talk about the x-ray here. Okay. Here you go. You want the chair as well? Anji, so very, very good evening everybody and I am here only to tell you ye x-ray pe you can see cannonball appearance I uh, and Dr. Deepthi has already told. So after you see the cannonball appearance, you what do you do? You correlate clinically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what I am here to tell you actually is not about the x-ray. Only thing I wanted to tell you today is, ye pehle to na, 
बहुत 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 अनसर्टेनिटी हो जाती है ना आई वॉन्ट यू टू नो दैट देर आर अप्स एंड डाउन इन लाइफ वो होंगे होंगे प्लस देर आर अप्स एंड डाउन हैपनिंग इन योर एग्जाम पैटर्न कोई कहता है नीट समबडी सेज इट विल बी नीट पीजिए समबडी सेज इज गोइंग टू बी नेक्स्ट समबडी सेज कुछ भी नहीं होगा कोई कहता है थ्योरी होगा एंड ऑल दिस कीप्स हैपनिंग माय ओनली थिंग फॉर यू टुडे इज एंड आई वांट यू ऑल टू रिपीट आफ्टर मी इन द चैट बॉक्स ठीक है बोलना है लिखो सोचो यू हैव टू से माय सेल्फ वर्थ इज नॉट डिपेंडेंट ऑन एनी एक्सटर्नल आउटकम ठीक है थोड़ा लंबा है मेरा सेल्फ वर्थ मैं अपने आप को कैसे देखता हूं इज नॉट डिपेंडेंट ऑन एनी नंबर एनी आउटकम एनी थिंग एक्सटर्नल दैट कैन हैपन आप उसके बियॉन्ड प्रेशियस हैं सो यू आर प्रेशियस विदाउट यू प्लीज कीप टेलिंग योर सेल्फ डोंट लेट योर सेल्फ एस्टीम और सेल्फ वर्थ गो फॉर अ टॉस जस्ट बिकॉज ऑफ द चेंजिंग पैटर्न जस्ट बिकॉज समबडी सेट के ये इस कॉलेज से रैंक आता है इस कॉलेज से नहीं आता आई एम अ पेरिफरल स्टूडेंट आई एम अ प्राइवेट स्टूडेंट आई एम अ फॉरन ग्रेजुएट ये सब हटाना दिमाग से don't tie your self worth to the places that you are right now placed aap kahan hain aaj us pe nahi sochenge and not at the numbers and the outcomes aap precious hain now once you liberate yourself from these prejudices and the biases aap jagah se apne aap ko label se hatate ho apne number se hatate ho and then you become liberated and then you have the ability to you know make a big impact अपने आप को आजाद करो इन चीजों से योर सेल्फ एस्टीम योर सेल्फ वर्थ इज नॉट लिंक टू एनी इंस्टीट्यूट एनी प्लेस एनी नंबर यू आर रॉकिंग अदरवाइज ऑल्सो एंड वी लव यू एंड आई एम हेयर टू टेल यू एज अ टीचर अगर इफ यू कम बैक टू मी एनी टाइम इन लाइफ वॉट एवर योर रैंक्स मे बी वॉट एवर यू मे बी डूइंग इन योर लाइफ जस्ट कम बैक एंड टेल मी दैट सर आई एम हैप्पी आई एल वेरी हैप्पी ओके जस्ट कम बैक एंड टेल मी कि सर मैं खुश हूं तो मैं भी बहुत खुश हूं ओके सो बी यू नो बी पॉजिटिव स्टे हैप्पी वी लव यू कीप वर्किंग हार्ड डोंट लेट डोंट यू नो टेक टू मच प्रेशर जस्ट बिकॉज ऑफ द चेंजिंग एग्जाम पैटर्न वी विल टेक केयर ऑफ द पैटर्न फॉर यू राइट सो आफ्टर द लिटिल पेप टॉक विद डॉक्टर सुमेर आई एम बैक टू द क्वेश्चन सो आवर पेशेंट इज अ केस ऑफ कोरियो कार्सिनोमा Now I want you to tell me. Can you tell me what stage GTN is this? What stage gestational trophoblastic neoplasia is this? So remember, metastasis to lungs is stage three, right? So metastasis to lungs is stage three. But now this is what is interesting. Although she is stage three, but do you know that mets to lung is considered as good prognosis? Yes. so metastasis to lungs is considered as good prognosis and do you know what score do we give it in the who scoring system a score zero right so score zero in a young patient right again she is going to get a score zero so most likely her total score is going to be less than 6 so if your patient's who score is less than or equal to 6 what do we call her we call her as low risk gtn now if your patient is low risk gtn what is the treatment of choice for her she has to now receive single agent to beta dhyan se suno it is single agent chemo right so only one drug and what is that drug the drug is methotrexate right so she will receive single drug but will she receive single dose no when you deal with neoplasia can you give only one dose of the drug no beta single dose methotrexate is something you give for ectopic here it is single agent but it has to be multi dose right so you will give a regime where we give multi dose methotrexate and in multi dose methotrexate do you know what, what we alternate it with so for example on day 1 3 and 5 we will give methotrexate of the week and on day 2 4 and 6 what will you give folinic acid folinic acid is given to prevent the side effects it's not a chemotherapeutic agent right so single agent but multi dose now you understand why the answer is d and not a 
yes so some of you were saying a a is single dose single dose is something you give for ectopic theek hai so this is going to be multi dose methotrexate yes uh, methotrexate is the preferred drug but if your patient is methotrexate resistant then yes we will put her on actinomycin d okay option number c some of you were saying option number c no option number c is multi agent regime okay so option number c is multi agent regime which is given to high risk gtn okay and when do you say she is high risk either she is stage 4 disease or she has a who score of more than or equal to 7 so stage 4 is also considered high risk who score of more than 7 or 7 uh, or more is also high risk then she will receive multi agent regime and the regime is emaco okay then the regime is emaco clear to everybody okay perfect so if you got this question right question number 5 give yourself a tick if you got the answer right but the application wrong or both right then give another tick okay chalo ready for the next one it is going to be on your screen now okay so your patient has 6 weeks amenorrhea okay and she has come to us with pain abdomen her vitals are stable and adnexal mass is palpated her serum hcg is 3000 transvaginal uterus shows empty uterus and an adnexal mass with cardiac activity what is the most appropriate management so now who is going to tell me what is the answer for this one come on everybody has to commit their answer okay everybody has to commit their answer what is the answer what is the answer right i can see some of you are commenting i want others to comment as well okay so yes what is the answer okay so now let's see the answer to this question is what to your surprise it is it is what it is salpingostomy the answer is d the answer is d okay now let's see what are we dealing with we are dealing with a case of ectopic pregnancy who is going to tell me is it a ruptured ectopic or unruptured ectopic so we are dealing with yes unruptured ectopic why because we are saying the vitals are uh, you know stable we are not giving you any signs of ruptured ectopic as well so this is a case of unruptured ectopic okay now look at the size of the ectopic pregnancy is it less than 3 cm yes look at the hcg value the hcg value is it less than 5000 yes right is she hemodynamically stable yes so do we meet criteria for medical management do we meet criteria for medical management the answer is no i am always going to tell my bachas that please read the last line the last line usually has the keyword to clinch the difference between one and the other option although all these criteria are okay for medical management but look at last line cardiac activity is present that's where the problem arises so please remember even when criteria for medical management are met but cardiac activity is present the preferred treatment is surgical okay now the preferred treatment becomes surgical had we given cardiac activity absent okay 
if we said cardiac activity absent then she would be a case for medical management okay so had these criteria has been met unruptured stable size is small hcg is less cardiac activity is present uh, sorry is absent then we would have given medical management and as i said in the medical management we give single dose so now it is single dose methotrexate but because cardiac activity is present therefore the preferred treatment is surgical now tell me will you do a laparoscopy or a laparotomy we will do a laparoscopy and what are you going to do inside on the tube so because it is unruptured we will do a salping gostomy yes everybody i hope the doubt is cleared yes is it interesting because this is what you are going to really do when you start doing clinics this is where you put two and two together and everything becomes algorithmic everything starts to make sense it's clear on what you are going to do right so the answer to this question is salping gostomy okay we can't do an expectant management expectant management is done when you don't see any mass forget about you know cardiac activity with a bilkuli big no hai okay and hcg value should be less than 200 okay we can't do serial hcg we already know that there is a pregnancy outside we are seeing cardiac activity so i don't need to do serial hcg is that clear even then nakshe it doesn't matter even if the mcq says primi gravida gravida is no criteria for treatment so had it been primi or multi the answer would remain the same beta j is that clear to everybody yes okay are you ready now let's go on to the next one 200 so please remember for expectant management the value has to be less than 200 and a falling trend no sac should be visible okay no sac should be visible the patient has to be hemodynamically stable okay everybody is that clear chalo aage bade. ready for the next one okay so the next one on your screen is going to come in a moment okay now comes the next question the increased incidence of this finding is seen with which of the following medications when used in pregnancy what is the finding here come on we all have to integrate everything gross findings radiological findings clinical findings everything together what is the finding spina bifida and it is an here what you see is a open neural tube defect we can even see the spinal cord contents right so we are seeing a patient with spina bifida or a neural tube defect and when we see this out of the given drugs what do you think is the answer perfect very good i can see everybody is answering correctly so happy and very proud of you the answer is valproic acid right so sodium valproate is known classically to cause neural tube defects as well as cleft palate and cleft lip it can even cause cardiovascular anomalies but spina bifida or neural tube is quite characteristic okay now before i tell you something more quickly what is the classic anomaly that you would see with lithium Epstein's. So here instead of a baby, we'll show you a baby with a chest x-ray. So this would be Epstein's anomaly. What about diethyl still besterol? So this will cause a T-shaped uterus and it can also cause hypospadias and it can also cause what? It can cause clear cell cancer of vagina right so it can also cause clear cell cancer of vagina what about thalidomide in thalidomide we'll show you a newborn baby who looks like a flipper 
so you know the entire upper limbs are absent and the hands are attached to the body so like this so it looks like a flipper right so thalidomide is going to cause phocomelia where you have to remember it is a proximal limb defect okay it is a proximal limb defect now can you tell me this lady who has a previous history of neural tube defect what dose of folic acid do you want to give her so now the dose of folic acid that i want to give her will be 4 milligrams also with anti epileptics what is the dose that we want to give we want to give 4 milligrams and when do you want to give it 3 months before to 3 months after conception right so 3 months before to 3 months after conception who is going to tell me what will you do after 3 months after 3 months she no longer needs high dose okay so after 3 months high dose is not required we will stop the high dose and we will now put her on iron folic acid tablets and how much is the folic acid content of IFA tab? It will be 0.5 milligrams. So in the IFA tab, it is going to be 0.5 milligrams, not 0.4. In the IFA, it is 0.5 because this is the RDA of folic acid in pregnancy, right? So you know what to do if you have got question number 7 correct, put it tick mark. And if you got the application right, put a tick mark. Yes? Everyone, are you enjoying the process of question solving? Okay. Yes? Are you enjoying? I'm enjoying. Actually, this is so much fun to integrate things and then you feel like you, you know, you can put all your information into clinical work. So, let's move forward and let's go on to question number 8. Question number 8 on your screens now. Yes, so your patient is 18 years old and she has come to us with what? Nausea and vomiting, right? So she has come to us with nausea and vomiting. What else do we see? We are asking you which of the following signs or symptoms would indicate a more serious disease of hyperemesis gravidarum, right? So, when would we say that my patient has hyperemesis gravidarum? Everyone ready? So, what is the answer to this question? What is the answer to this question? Okay, so let's look at this. So, here the answer is going to be B. Absolutely right. It is hypokalemia. Right? Why? Because for hyperemesis gravidarum, the patient has to have severe nausea and vomiting. And this severe nausea and vomiting will cause what? Because of excessive vomiting and she is not able to take anything, she will develop electrolyte imbalance right so she will develop electrolyte imbalance so the characteristic finding is hypokalemia what else can we do you know we might actually show you an ecg showing you the changes of hypokalemia and then we will ask you what is the diagnosis so answer will be hyperemesis gravidarum can you tell me when do you say that it is hyperemesis gravidarum so when the nausea and vomiting is so severe that it will cause a weight loss. What is the minimum requirement? At least 5%, right? So, at least 5% from the pre-pregnancy weight loss and along with this, the patient should have ketone urea, right? So, along with this, the patient should have what? Ketone urea. Then you will say that this is a patient of, yes, Nausea and vomiting nahi, but hyperemesis gravidarum, right? Is that clear to everybody? Okay. Now, uh, what would be the other findings? Who is going to tell me 
Yes. Who is going to tell me what hormone is responsible for this? The hormone responsible is mainly HCG. So you have to answer one. You have to answer HCG. But please remember, estrogen and progesterone also contribute. Right? So estrogen and progesterone are also going to contribute. Yes? Now because HCG is the risk factor, conditions with high HCG will become a risk factor. So therefore, can you tell me important risk factors? So important risk factors are, yes, very, very important, multiple or multi-fetal pregnancy. So twins, triplets, quadruplets and molar pregnancy. Right? So, wherever the HCG is high, those things can become a risk factor. The special ones are multifetal and molar pregnancy. Right? Also, can you tell me which infection is linked to hyperemesis? So, it is going to be H. pylori. Right? So, the infection linked is H. pylori. Yes? Okay, can you tell me which vitamin deficiency these patients can develop? Maybe we integrate it further and we ask you which, what can be a neurological finding in this patient? So, suppose we don't ask you diagnosis, we ask you what neurological complication can be seen in patients with hyperemesis gravidarum? Can you tell me? So, very, very important, they can develop Wernicke's encephalopathy, okay? So, they can develop Wernicke's encephalopathy, okay? So, that is the neurological complication that they can develop. Is that clear to everyone? Yes? So, Wernicke's encephalopathy is what they can develop. Also, please remember, also, please remember, they can develop vitamin K deficiency, okay? So, they can actually come with coagulation defects as well. These are very important. So, they can come to us with vitamin K deficiencies. So, they may even have coagulation defects, okay? Then, the important thing I want to ask you here is, when you say it is hyperemesis, can she have thyroid dysfunction? Yes. So, please remember these patients can also have signs of hyperthyroidism. Okay, so they can have signs of hyperthyroidism. Who is going to give me the concept why? The concept is alpha subunit of HCG resembles the alpha subunit of TSH. Okay, and that is why they can present to us with symptoms of hyperthyroidism. Right? Okay, so these are some of the important things. But for diagnosis, we need weight loss and ketonuria. Okay, so they can have multiple other complications like acute kidney injury, like even a Mallory vs tear, which is the tear of the esophagus, right? So those complications can also happen, but they are uncommon. Okay, shallow. Should we move further now? All right. The next question on your screen is coming now. Your patient is 12 weeks pregnant and we have done an NT scan for her. The NT scan shows a value of 4.6. She undergoes a CVS. What is CVS? Chorionic villus sampling, which shows a karyotype of 46XY. Her fetus still needs evaluation for which of the following? Can you tell me? Uh, this fetus needs evaluation still for what? Okay, everybody, you have to commit your answers. <clears throat> All right, I want everyone to quickly commit your answers so that I can discuss the question. Right, so... The answer to this question is, is, is not A. The answer is B. Okay, the answer is B. But Chaz, when the NT is increased, which is more than or equal to 3 mm, we are supposed to do a karyotyping. 
in this patient the karyotyping is already done and it shows a normal karyotype there is no aneuploidy if there was aneuploidy we would document it there how do you write aneuploidy how do you write a karyotype if it is aneuploidy would i say 46 in that case no then i would have written 47 yes so this is a normal karyotype so which means what have we ruled out we have now ruled out aneuploidy which means all of you know that the most common cause of raised nt is aneuploidy but what is the second leading cause the second leading cause is cardiac anomalies right so the second leading cause is cardiac anomalies so this bacha would need an evaluation for cardiac anomalies how would you do that so we will do a level 2 ultrasound but very importantly along with this we will also do a fetal echocardiography okay we will also do a fetal echocardiography when do you do level 2 ultrasound and fetal echo between 18 to 22 weeks so both level 2 ultrasound and fetal echo also are done between 18 to 22 weeks right so answer is actually cardiac defects can you also tell me apart from when you say aneuploidy is in general the most common cause of increased nt is aneuploidy can you tell me which aneuploidy so trisomy 21 followed by monosomy x okay so trisomy 21 followed by monosomy x do you or can you tell me a third important cause of raised nt what is a third important cause of raised nt so remember it is twin twin transfusion syndrome so in twin pregnancy it is an early marker of twin twin transfusion syndrome is that clear to everyone yes so these are three important causes although there can be other genetic causes for example noonan syndrome de george syndrome there could be other anomalies also that can cause it for example you know lung hypoplasia for example diaphragmatic problems right but these three are must knows is that clear okay what is the ideal time to measure nt the ideal time is 11 to 13 plus 6 if you have to mark one answer the answer has to be 11 weeks so if you have to mark one answer the answer is 11 the range is 11 to 13 plus 6 right is that clear okay please remember when we do an nt scan the baby has to be in the mid sagittal plane okay the baby has to be in the kept in the mid the measurement has to be taken in the mid sagittal plane and the measurement has to be taken at the widest area and it has to be taken from inner to inner border okay so inner to inner border widest area in the sagittal plane and remember amnion should be seen separately so amnion should be seen separate from the nuchal translucency okay so these are important things all right is that clear okay no here there is no finding of duodenal atresia then why should you think of it okay so this is a finding of increased nt okay chalo so we are going to go on to the next question quickly mark your score for question number nine i am going to move on question number 10 now your patient has come for her first prenatal visit at 10 weeks she is having a previous no not her her ba her friend okay her friend had a fetus with down syndrome she is concerned about her own risk of a baby with same disorder which test will you offer her can you tell me okay which test will you offer her 
or you don't need to offer anything so please remember down screening should be offered to all pregnant women okay so this should be offered to all pregnant women but which one are you going to tell her to get done now commit your answer quickly everybody please commit your answer so what is the answer to this question so as i see all of you are typing your answers and i'm really happy about that i am going to disclose the answer now the answer is not d it is c okay the answer is c can you tell me in which trimester is your patient she is in the first trimester what are the tests available in the first trimester so one test is dual test right and one test is ultrasound for nt and we are going to combine the two because that has higher sensitivity so when you combine the two this is what is called as combined test so combined test is a test of first trimester right and we include both in this because it becomes a test with higher sensitivity okay so now what is included in the dual test so in the dual test it is going to be hcg and pap a this is also done between 11 to 13 weeks what are the findings if the risk is increased so risk is increased in the patient if hcg is higher than expected and pap a is less than expected right so why is the answer not triple and quadruple test why are they incorrect answers because triple and quadruple test are done in the second trimester okay so it is done in the second trimester all right and when you talk about second trimester yes these can be done anywhere between 15 to 22 weeks anywhere between 15 to 22 weeks the triple and the quad test right what are the markers of the quad hcg alpha fetoprotein ue3 and inhibin a triple has hcg has alpha fetoprotein has ue3 but does not have inhibin a hcg and inhibin a will be higher than expected while alpha fetoprotein and ue3 will be less than expected yes clear to everyone okay so you know what to do if you've done it right give your score a tick mark if wrong genuinely give it a cross don't worry the idea is to keep improving and to keep learning